you're back in uh europe yes thanks for doing this again man of course I feel like well, we can't talk about it until we start taping, but so much has happened. Right, right. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. I think last time we talked, I didn't, did I say anything about American Idol? You couldn't. I couldn't. I was like, something's happening, but I couldn't yeah. say what it was or something right. like that. Yeah. Hello and welcome to At The Podium with me, Patrick Huey. At The Podium is a multimedia platform that brings together people from a diverse background of lives, careers, and experiences who all share one thing in common. They have stepped fully into the transformative power of finding and raising their voices to make an impact on the world we live in today. At The Podium holds a space for everyone to share their stories, to be heard, and to bring us inspiration. Today, I'm thrilled to share the podium with Skylar Maxi Wirt. Skylar Maxi Wirt was born in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. He received his early dance training from the Lancaster School of Ballet under Caroline Trithall and Victor Yalihoen. At age 13, he moved to New York City to join the Jacqueline Kennedy Onassis School of American Ballet Theater. He then joined the Symphopera Ballet in Dresden, Germany at age 18, where he is still currently dancing. He has appeared in numerous productions, including The Sleeping Beauty as Bluebird, The Nutcracker as The Prince, Theme and Variations by George Balanchine, and Pierre Gint by Johann Inger. He has also designed roles in the new creations of Cow by Alexander Ekman, and Songs for Siren by Joseph Hernandez. Appearing on the 20th season of American Idol, he has also branched out of the dance world to explore the realm of music. Before we hear from Skylar today, I want to invite you to share at the podium with the people in your lives. If you find our conversation today helpful, and I, I hope that you will, take a screenshot and share on your Instagram and tag at the podium underscore Patrick Huey. Or if you're on Facebook or LinkedIn, share our links there. Your shares, likes, and five-star written reviews help grow our audience and move us up the charts. <laughs> I am grateful for your support in this capacity. Okay, Skylar, welcome to At The Podium. Thanks for having me again. I guess I, I, guess I should say actually welcome back because we had you on in the very first season of the show. Yes. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to have you back because your life over the past year has gone through an unbelievable change. You have become an uncle. <laughs> you have gotten engaged. Mm -hmm. You released two amazing songs on Spotify, which we're going to talk about. You self-produced them. Uh, it's called yeah. Throne. They're called Throne and Honey Dipped Rose. And then you appeared on American Idol and received a triple standing ovation from Lionel Richie, Katy Perry, and Luke Bryan. Could you have even imagined what your life was going to look like a year from that time? Yeah, I mean, it, it's kind of crazy um, how it all kind of happened with American Idol. And it's funny because it, it's kind of, you know, I think things don't really, you know, nothing really random happens, you know, you kind of, um, things happen for a reason, but in a way it did feel like it kind of came out of nowhere. I, how I got onto American Idol in the first place, I was just posting like random kind of covers of songs on my Instagram. And um, Brandon Boyd from uh, the band Incubus, he saw some of my videos um, on Instagram and he reached out and he was just kind of like, you know, I think you're, really talented and what do you want to do with with singing and at, at first I was kind of like well, I don't know I'm just kind of like feeling it out and like you know just putting my stuff out there and then he suggested that I go on American Idol because he was in I think they called it a, a uh, like a guest uh, mentor or something oh, yes. or a coach or something on mm -hmm. the season previous season so um he kind of set me up with um you know I got a recommended recommendation from him and I had a little kind of FaceTime chat with the producers and then bam, I was on the show. So it all kind of happened really fast. And 
yeah, it was like a whirlwind, but um, I'm really happy I did it. I think I gained a lot from it. And, I mean, there was one yeah. thing and I, I had to write it down because it was so beautiful what, what Luke Bryan said, who has 23 number one hits on the country charts, which I had no idea he had that many number one hits. Um, yeah. But he said, you're holding these notes and making them tangible moments. Like you weren't just up there singing the song yeah. and you sang and I couldn't, I was like, you have a lot of courage because you sang Donny Hathaway. Yeah. <laughs> and I was like, if you come up anywhere singing Donny Hathaway, you're really making a statement about who you are as a singer and an artist because he was probably one of the most gifted singers ever. And I'm not saying that to be dramatic, but what he could convey through, amazing. what he could convey through his voice and the emotion and the range of his work was just spectacular. And you sang yeah. the song so beautifully. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, he's he's a huge like vocal inspiration of mine. I mean, he's like, he's just, his voice is just so beautiful. And um, I was happy with, with the response from the judges because obviously it was, it was a very good response, but I, I worked, I never um, really worked, um, like took singing classes or anything before, but uh, leading up a couple months before my audition, I, start, I did start taking, um, start working with the coach. And we really focused a lot on um, the performance of the song and getting the emotion of the song across. Mm -hmm. And I, I was happy with the performance I gave just because I felt like I, I did that. So I felt kind of accomplished in that. And after he said that, I was kind of like, oh, okay, I did what I came to do. So, <laughs> you know, like, I, yeah. Did you, when so, you were in that moment, you were the last singer of that day, I believe they said when you- Yes. Came, did you have any expectation? that you were gonna get the response that you got and then be moved on to Hollywood week? I came in like, not knowing what the response would be, but having in my mind that I would perform, you know, to my fullest extent. I just kind of, I kind of went into it thinking about it as a performance, mm. as opposed to kind of like trying to prove myself because I think that would have just made me even more nervous. And I was nervous, I was really nervous. Yeah. I mean, I never, it was my first ever kind of like professional, thing as as singer you know so um and and it's so you walk into the room and it's just like lights and then it's like katie P katie perry's like right in the middle with these like <laughs> some blue eyes and you're just like oh my god it's really happening and they're just like lit and then they're mic'd so like their voices from everywhere it's like a very overwhelming experience so i was just like let me just uh ground myself by thinking of it as a performance you know and how they and and just try to be as honest as i can because then it's it's just up to them. I did all I can do. You know what I mean? Yeah, I, I was very happy to see that they enjoyed the the song. <laughs> they loved it. They loved it. Yeah. And they and they ask you. You. I mean, I love what you said uh, on that day. You said, "I've been on such a specific path for so long that I never took the time to invest in myself as a singer." So yeah. so why now? Why this? What I, what I'm calling the renaissance of Skylar, because your life is mm -hmm. to be just expanding in, in huge ways. That's a very good question. And I'll be honest with you, I don't know if I have the best answer. It's just kind of, um, I think that I've always had in myself that I wanted to, that I enjoyed singing. And I always um, kind of had this idea that like, I would want to do something with it, but I, didn't, I never knew how that was actually going to happen. And when this opportunity came with American Idol, I was kind of like, oh, maybe that's, I, my, 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 actually my, my first instinct when, uh, when this guy, uh, Brandon contacted me and everything, I was not, I wasn't sure. I was like, oh, should I, should I do this? Like, I'll have to leave Dresden. I have to leave my job um, that I've worked my whole life basically to get to, you know, um, and to do this thing that I don't even know what it really, is or really, you know I, I'm not in that world ever so um I just decided to not have any expectations and just kind of go for it and I think that taking that that leap kind of proved to myself that like this is something that I want to do with my life as well as dance mm. and I'm still kind of figuring out how that looks being a dancer and and finding my voice through music and stuff like that um, but it's definitely that whole the whole experience with American Idol uh, definitely opened me up to um, to be just being more serious about my singing and about making music. And did the ballet in Dresden support you going? I mean, clearly you went and you still had your job. Yeah, 
Yeah, they they completely supported me. Um, basically, I only so I went in November first to Nashville, and that was where I was there from. I was only there for like four days, maybe. Mm. Um, that's when I recorded the the audition that was aired, and then after that I came back, and then uh, for that I only uh I don't think I missed. I had I had a meeting with with my director, and I basically told him, you know, this is a situation. I got this really cool opportunity. I don't want to miss it. Um, and he he let me um, leave for Nutcracker because normally I, I would go. I when I went back to um, to LA, this was in December, so that's like Nutcracker time. And funny enough, uh, this was like in the midst of Corona and everything. Still, we were performing, but right when December happened, Corona hit again, and all the shows were canceled. Right. So I was actually in LA, and everything in Dresden was shut down. And so I actually didn't really miss like anything and it just kind of happened that way it wasn't really planned I was planning to, to miss a lot of kind of you know a full performance but um yeah I ended up coming back to Dresden in January and then we continued with Nutcracker into January and um so it worked out but luckily my my director was very understanding and um he let me go and kind of like you know try it out so I mean those yeah. people who let us fly are really instrumental in our success usually absolutely yeah because if he if he would have said no it would have I mean, none of it would have happened and that would have been a shame. And I wouldn't even be making music now, I don't think, so. Right, right. Yeah. You know, I listened to you on Instagram and I, of course, watched the the American Idol piece that you were in. And I'm curious who are your musical influences because when I'm listening to you, I hear the R&B, the modern r and B. I I hear, I even hear a little bit of like the old time Motown sound as well. So who... Yeah. who who really, who, a, who exposed you to that music? And then are those your influences? Are they, are they part of what helps you make your music today? Definitely, yeah, they definitely are. I would say I draw a lot of inspiration from like old, like soul music and um, what people sometimes refer to as like neo soul and like Motown and R&B music. And I think I, it was the music I grew up around. My mom really liked Motown. And um, um, a huge, like my favorite artist, in the world probably is Erica Badu. She's like huge inspiration. You better and call Tyrone. I got that from, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Tell him come on. So, uh, my sister, my sister listens to Erica Badu a lot. So like I from her, I got that music kind of from her, like, you know, listening to what she um, listened to growing up. And um I don't know. It's I I love like Johnny Hathaway, Luther Vandross, uh, you know, that kind of era, Anita Baker, that time of music. Mm -hmm. Um, I listen to a lot of old music. I like newer, newer artists too, like like Ari Lennox is a huge one that I'm a big fan of now. Um, but I've always just liked older music, even like old, old like Billie Holiday and Ella Fitzgerald stuff like that too. I don't know. It's just uh, it always kind of resonated with me, and I always, um, I yeah, because I wasn't, uh, I'm not necessarily like a trained singer, so I would kind of. I remember when I was younger, like also John Legend was a big inspiration. And I, when I was younger, I would just kind of sit in my room and try to like sing like him, I guess. And I feel like I kind of learned to sing from these old singers because yeah. that's what I listened to. And that's what I would try to like copy. Right. So. What is it like for you? Because you've spent your entire life expressing through dance, through your body. And here you are now literally expressing through your voice. And I wonder what that gives you as a person and an artist to to increase your vocabulary to include singing what is that giving you as a person mm -hmm. and an artist um i what i like about it is that it's really like on my terms you know when i'm when i'm making a song and it's just like it's it's i get to just like play and kind of do whatever i i want you know what i mean mm -hmm. and i think i'm as a dancer uh, especially as in a, you know, a ballet dancer in a ballet company, um, it's a lot of, you know, taking direction and, um, you know, you working with the choreographer, you don't necessarily choose what you dance all the time, but you kind of, um, you work with what you're given, you know, so to speak. And with being on the other side, like, of, you know, creating things and it, it's nice to take a break from, um, it's nice to kind of like determine what I want to do. You know what I mean? Does that makes sense. Yeah. And it's it's right now. I I think it's kind of a, a luxury that I'm in a situation where 
I'm, I am an artist and I have a stable job and everything, but I get to do music however I want to do it. I'm, right now, I'm not reliant on appealing to anybody with my music. I can just do exactly how I want to do it. And um, yeah, that's, that's really nice. And I hope that I can hold on to that as long as possible. Because there does come to a certain point where, you know, you have to kind of appeal to people to, to you know, for them to like your music if you want to, like, you know, make money off of it. So hopefully I can find the balance between um, somehow, you know, being able to produce, produce exactly what I want and also appealing to other people to find yeah. balance, I think. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's the artistic struggle, right? When you... Yeah create you normally start creating what feels good to you and then when you try to monetize that or in increase the scope of what you're doing and reach a broader audience those those questions about is it relevant is it current is it timely start to really impact the creative process and you kind of hope that your art can still be your art even as you try to monetize it and, and have it reach yes. a larger audience or sometimes Absolutely. you just or sometimes you just, you know, it's just, it's just the art that you're creating for yourself. But I, I think I think most people want to create art for art to be viewed and to be a part of the, the conversation for people, just, be, just beyond yeah. their peer group. It's a fine balance to kind of, um, you know, maintain your unique voice and do kind of what you want, but then also, um, you know, find an audience that is interested. You had said when we first, talked last year which was right around when all this American Idol stuff was happening and you were very good about not talking about it <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> but you had said something interesting and I wrote it down because I was re-listening to what we had talked about and you said that for you to achieve the repertoire that you were doing at Simp Opera you had to rethink your ideas about classical training and that you had to change and grow your relationship to what you were taught and I wonder how that opening up your ideas about all of that maybe helped channel you through the doors of singing. That's interesting. Um, I think I think maybe um, becoming more like confident in myself as a as a dancer and in my my place as as a dancer um, allowed me to branch off a little bit. I think before I would have been like so scared to to leave even for like a month from from my company to do something else because I would have thought like oh it means I'm not dedicated enough or it means um, um, I'm gonna miss out on something or whatever whatever and I, I I guess when when the opportunity came with American Idol I was at the point where I was uh, stable enough in myself to know that I could leave and come back and still pick up right where I left off or not miss out on anything because I'm not. Um, you know, scrambling to be seen necessarily anymore, or I'm not, um, you know, I'm just more, more, more stable within how I, how I see myself as an artist and as a dancer and, mm -hmm. and all of that. And you also said in that first interview that dance was a physical manifestation of something on the inside of you. And I wonder what does singing manifest for you? Mm -hmm. um, I think before, uh, yeah, before American Idol and before I got kind of more serious about singing, I would have said that um, that dancing and singing were like two very, very different like sensations within myself, artistically, whatever. But now I think they're much more similar than than different. I think they're just they're they're two different mediums, of course, but um, they're kind of like two sides of one coin. I think that um, they're. I don't know. I think I think dance is a very. Um, I think music is a bit broader. It, it reaches more people than dance does. Dance is beautiful, and I love dance, and you love dance, and a lot of people love dance, but a lot of people don't. But I don't really know of anyone who doesn't love music. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I think you can. I think with. I think music is a bit more um, universal. Dance is also universal, but I think music even more so. It comes even before dance. You know, because right. you dance to music. Usually. So I think it's interesting. It's also more, it's a little bit more current, you know, being a ballet dancer, it's kind of a, a specific uh, art form that not a lot of people know about. Um, and music, especially the music I like, it's, it's, uh, it's more, yeah, it's more, more current, more, I think uh, people can relate to it more. Like I've done, you know, 
pretty well so far and my dance career and everything and I post about it and stuff but when I got on American Idol was when people were really from my hometown you know writing me and like oh my god you've made it you've done this like amazing thing and then that meanwhile I've been like you know dancing for all this time and <laughs> nobody has said anything and it's fine but it's it's what people relate to you know it's just more um it's easier to understand I think than than ballet you're right it does you know something like American Idol does have that kind of reach that mm -hmm. perhaps perhaps ballet doesn't have but I, I would imagine Misty Copeland might feel or have a different yeah on that <laughs> yeah it's definitely changing it's definitely changing um there's things happening and there's there's more like um combining of, of worlds now the current kind of um you know uh, pop world or popular culture world and ballet is definitely um, intermingling now more than it did in the past. But there's still, but there's still that that separation that um, music is a bit broader. I would say for now, it is, and it's it's, it's interesting you, know. you bring that up because you know the fine arts like ballet, even like opera. I mean, Kathleen Battle did the duet with Alicia Keys that had millions of views on. Yeah on YouTube and Renee Fleming a few years ago singing the national anthem at the Super Bowl, that it's raised the visibility of these once really sort of rarefied arts and people are really, particularly your generation is really finding these arts and really grateful for them and really investing in them and, and seeing the value in them, yeah. perhaps in a way that my generation didn't when we were <laughs> your age. We all wanted yeah. to be on about that was about it, you know? Yeah, and I wonder if that has to do with the, you know, social media um it's more you know there's so many dancers on on instagram or tiktok or whatever who, who can post and there's so it's the easy access now yes. and before even when i was like younger you had to know you know online which website to go to or before that you had to go to a library and look up these old old tapes or whatever but now everything is so accessible you can see an amazing dancer just on your phone or, mm -hmm. you know. and i think it's smart too because on the social platforms the ballet dancers are now mixing in pop music to the choreography yeah. they're doing, you know? Yeah, yeah. I wonder for you, Skylar, how the singing is impacting the dance? Well, the, the biggest thing I think isn't so much how it's directly affecting my dance, but how um, having another outlet in general affects, uh, affects my work as a dancer. Or like, because sometimes me personally, I have a tendency to, you know, get so focused on on work and dance and everything, and I get really like um, wrapped up. And I think for any artist, it's good to have a different outlet that's also artistic, but outside of your main thing. You know, so when I when I'm like working on a song and singing whatever, it's like Skylar the singer, and I can kind of like put Skylar the dancer in the back a little bit just for that time. And for me, it I always come back to dance um, more kind of refreshed. And it's 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 given me um, a lighter feeling about my work as a dancer, which kind of has opened me up to be a bit more, I guess, free. And um, it's allowed me to have a bit more more freedom in my idea of myself as a dancer, I guess. That mm -hmm. makes sense. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You've said that ballet, being a dancer, shaped your body, shapes your body. Mm -hmm. I wonder how that dance, how dance shapes you as a person. Hmm, that's a good question. It's, <laughs> I think because in order to, I would say in order to move forward as a dancer, you have to let go of, like I said before, like things that you've learned or things that you've picked up or ideas that you've had about yourself. And you have to kind of like peel back layers in order to find who you are truthfully as a dancer. And that's probably, that's probably the same for any art form. But I think particularly with dance, because it's so personal and it's you, it's your body, soul, mind, connection, everything, you know. Um, so I think as a person, it's required me. And as a dancer, I've, I've had to kind of um, really look at myself and understand myself and um, know, know my strengths, know my weaknesses, know my worth, and um, be able to confidently kind of understand that without any doubt at all. And I think that has translated also into me and my personal life, me as a person. Mm. Um, but it, but I don't know if I would have come to that so quickly if it weren't if it weren't had been for for dance. You just talked about knowing your worth, and that 
struck a chord in me because I think we're sort of in a time where people are trying to figure out the value of life, the value of what it means to be human, what it means to be trans, what it means to be queer, what it means to be straight, what it means to be living in a particular time and place. Can you talk about that journey to understanding your worth and what what you as Skylar bring to any process that you're engaged in, whether it's dancing, singing, writing a music, writing your own music? It, like it took me a while to just be able to say to somebody that like yeah I'm I'm a talented dancer or to just to just confidently say that I was talented, just because um, you know I think I talked about this a little bit in our in our last interview but just because the environment of a you know dance company or dance schooling is so intense and it's so um, so much about um, kind of perfecting yourself that it, it's easy to get wrapped up in like oh not good enough thing or whatever and um, but realizing that you have, yeah, that you have everything you need and under, yeah, understanding your worth and not, um, I guess the, the most important thing I think that I've learned is that when you, when you truly understand your worth, nobody can take it away from you. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Mm -hmm. No matter what your situation is, anything could happen. Um, you know, companies are changing all the time rapidly. And I think as long as you have if you're centered with, with that, with like knowing yeah, who you are as an artist, nobody can take that away from you. Yeah, you know, I think you said something very interesting that when you're in school and you said that you have to leave the school things behind, the training things behind yeah. and start to express the artist, the artist within yourself. And I think about so many times, and, I, and I've been through conservatory training, so much of the focus is on what you're not doing right. Yeah. You know, that mm -hmm. sometimes can zap the energy of what initially brought you to the thing in the first place. You know, that that's far that want that made you want to be a dancer or a singer or an actor or a saxophone player, whatever it may be. And that the concern and that and that's kind of the the trap of conservatory training is that it's everything is wrong. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And so your yeah. worth or your idea of what you contribute is minimized because you're you're really trying to fix things that perhaps mm -hmm. need to fix, maybe don't. Um, yeah, you know, yeah. School, we had a lot of, you know, training on how to speak. I don't know if people want to hear me speak <laughs> proper English all the time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know? Okay. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, I, I think there's something about stepping into your full self mm -hmm. where you can say, you know, my turnout might not be the best, but I have 18 other things that I do really, really well. You yeah, know? exactly. Or, you know, whatever it may be. And I, um, um yeah there's some there's so many things there's so many things that you could be insecure about or whatever and you you kind of realize that it's not as big of a deal as you think it is usually you know what I mean right. and once you and I think that's um you know all you can be is really yourself so don't try to be anything else because you know why would you and when you when you're truly yourself anyway um you have no reason to to be nervous or because it is what it is it and is. i think that's that's that same for for any any art form dancing singing you know even on the business side there's so much the reviews were so much written around what you aren't doing right and i even mm -hmm. see on the business side that the reviews are much more of well what are you doing that's good and let's keep reinforcing what's good because that is where people gain confidence and gain expertise and gain the, the idea that they're making a true contribution. And I think it's a, you know, it's, it's a subtle shift, but I think it's an important shift that we need to focus on what's good and what's right. Absolutely. Over the past, I can't believe it's been almost three years now, but over the past three years, we've had so much happen in the world. We've had COVID and now we're looking down the barrel of monkeypox or whatever we're gonna call it. Yeah. Um, yeah. We've had George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and so many others. We've had controversies in the political systems that we would be in. And now we're seeing global warming have real impacts. And I wonder what you think your role is for your generation, which is the future, in mm -hmm. picking up this mantle and the struggle for the expansion of human rights, for having a clean and sustainable environment and having equity for everybody on the planet. I think uh, it's difficult because it's so these like, you know, old issues that are now just kind of 
getting to a tipping point, right? We're getting to this like bubbling, like this is everything's kind of boiling over. Um, I feel like the most important thing is to just be open and understanding and try to understand people that aren't like you or people who haven't been brought up like you or, um, you know, because I feel like especially in the United States, politics are so polarizing and I feel like more and more um, extremes on both sides, kind of. And it's always, it, it seems like there's never a, like a middle ground that people can agree on. And um, I think sometimes when you um, kind of, uh, people feel alienated and I think that's why they get so defensive. And there, there's, um, I think it's, it's important for us in general in every situation to kind of remain a bit uh, flexible and understanding, but still stand our ground on, on certain things. Mm. And I, I just, I hope that that's the direction that we're moving in. I don't know if it is, but. Uh, you've traveled the world, you've, you've lived in different countries. Why do you think, and this is not just, it's happening everywhere. And I wonder yeah. what your perspective is on why is it so hard for people to embrace people who are different from them, who have a different set of beliefs from them? Why is yeah. it that we start to reduce it to my way is right, your way is wrong, versus being able to really live in the gray middle and really yeah. allow, you know, to hold two conflicting thoughts, you know? Like mm -hmm. a, person, a person can think that, I mean, you, you're, you're engaged, you're about to be married, and, and people could have feelings about that because they didn't, may not believe that two men should be married. Right. But why can't we, and maybe I'm asking this in a larger sense of the word, but why can't we mm -hmm. live in a space where if someone disagrees with that, that's fine. Mm -hmm. But they're not out right. slating against you. They're not out trying to prevent you from being married. They're not out condemning you. It's just that right. we have we have to have that space where we can meet in the middle and yeah. be human together. It's an interesting thing because, especially with the, uh, the you know issue of homosexuality, because my as a gay man, my initial reaction when somebody, maybe it's because of the generation I've come from, my <laughs> initial reaction of when somebody is you know a bit homophobic or doesn't have um, you know it doesn't think well of my quote unquote lifestyle, as they like to say, um, my initial reaction is like. Um, I just don't have time for it. You know what I mean? I don't, I don't, um, I don't indulge and I kind of um, am not so quick to give them the benefit of the doubt. And I think that's something that in myself um, is not, is not helpful, you know, because at the end of the day, I don't, it's normally the people that think this way come from a very different upbringing, different generation, um, have their own issues that they need to work out. And that's why they, they maybe don't see the world the way that I see it. So. Mm -hmm even in the midst of um, intense ignorance, I think it's still important to maybe try to understand other people's point of views so that we can, you know, I wouldn't, sometimes it's, finding middle ground is hard to say in an issue like this because um, I don't want to find middle ground. I want you to just not be homophobic. You know what I mean? I want you to flip to the other side, you know? Right. So, right. so I, I, it's hard to say find the middle ground, but I guess, um, just you know the ability finding that ability to allow people to just like be themselves mm. um yeah I don't know I think I don't know what the answer to, to it is though I think for me uh what what I can do personally is just um not avoid having difficult conversations with people and not just kind of like shut people out when I think that they 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 feel a certain type of way about me or you know try to try to be you know kind and nice to everyone because maybe I'm the only gay pe person that they they've ever come across you know mm. and then if I treat them poorly it's just going to further their idea their negative stereotype of gay people but if I could be a, a, a positive gay person maybe it could change their idea of what being gay is or you know what I mean even though that's that's kind of difficult to do because my initial reaction sometimes is just like okay you're you know pull the crap go away but that doesn't actually help the situation. That doesn't actually help anyone. Something you said that's very interesting is that oftentimes it, it is hard to have the patience and the, the love and understanding for a person in the gay issue, for instance, where they're really looking down on not supporting you. It's not about your lifestyle. It's about you. 
Um, but I think the only way to turn, and, and it's also difficult because oftentimes that comes with, well, if I don't agree with you, I don't think you have a right to exist. Or yeah. if I don't agree with you, I think you shouldn't have the same access to the same life, the same choices, the same opportunities that I have. And that's where it becomes hard when you're on the receiving end of that to pause and try to bring equity and 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 evenness to the conversation. And I struggle with it too, because I don't want to be guilty of the same sort of judgment and the same sort of pushback that I'm experiencing for another person. Yeah, of course. And I, and I think that's what's complicated. But I, I think the answer, and I think you you really stepped right onto the point of it, is that it's not about being abrasive or being argumentative is how do you deal with that person from a lens of love because that's the only way you change someone you don't change them by argument yeah. points absolutely not everyone has yeah. talking points everyone is armed with all the points all of the scripture all of the whatever about everything um yeah. so if you're going to change someone it's never going to be through an argument it's going to be through expressing the humanity that you have yeah exactly and um it's interesting because this this point in particular with um homosexuality and everything i feel like um as i'm writing more and trying to be kind of open and honest about my experience as a person i find that i'm a lot of the songs that i'm writing are very you know gay themed or very blatantly homosexual and i think if there was one thing that i would want to kind of express in my music is just um a kind of like, you know, I, I like the idea of writing, writing simple kind of love songs or whatever from a gay perspective that aren't necessarily um, gay music, but just gay by default because I, I'm gay. You know what I mean? Right. Because I think that's something now that we're finding the middle ground between like, if, you know, either something is like not gay at all or like super, <laughs> super gay in the sense of like, catering to a specific audience because you know people are going to love it because you meet this criteria as opposed to just um being gay as an afterthought just because it's natural and just because it's you know what I mean and we're not I feel like you know it's like this thing of the pendulum sing, swinging one way and then it has to eventually come back and then like meet in the center and I think it'll, it'll get there eventually but I guess with with my music and stuff I hope to kind of bring that energy a little bit are you going to keep writing your own music Yes, I have a couple songs in the works now. I'm working with some people in Berlin to kind of um, make make the production a bit more professional. And um, it's a slow process just because I'm also dancing and everything, but I am uh, still writing. And, yeah. Because you, you record every track, you're recording your own harmonies mm -hmm. music, which can't be easy. <laughs> but you know, it's funny because, um, so I grew up um, doing a capoeira, this Brazilian martial arts. And a big part of that is uh, singing. And in, in Capoeira, we, my trainer happened to be, my, our instructor for our group happened to have a really great voice. And so we would often just kind of sit around and work on songs and we would harmonize with each other. And so I kind of got developed an ear for harmony without um, just kind of naturally. It wasn't like, uh, you know, in a class or like learning about the, the notes. And so I couldn't really tell you you know, what would make a good harmony or whatever, but I can just kind of like feel it. And I think that was when, that was what was keeping me from, from writing in the first place was the fact that I wasn't trained and I didn't necessarily like know what to do. But after American Idol, speaking to all of these different kind, amazing singers, like so many amazing singers and all very different and they all wrote music and they were like, yeah, I wrote like 10 songs a day and, and they just wrote and you know, whatever came, came. And, um, so when I came back, I was kind of like, let me just use my own kind of natural intuition to guide me and like not overthink it. And so that's what I started doing. And I would, I would kind of hum something and then, oh, this, this, this harmony kind of sounds good. Let me record that. And it's very kind of just, yeah, playful. It's, it's interesting that, that, that your approach to music has been what comes more naturally and from your own inspiration which is the exact opposite of how you've approached your dance, which has been so, so technique based, yeah. so rooted in a very academic, not in the book sense, but in a, a philosophy sense type of training. Yeah, it's, it's funny. It's almost like, it's almost like one, one started one way and one started the other and they're kind of meeting in the middle a little bit. Like 
you know, yeah, like exactly like you said, dancing is very strict training and everything. And now I'm kind of finding the the release and the freedom as a, as a professional and still working on that actually. And with singing, it, it came from a complete place of just doing it for fun and doing, you know, my own instinct. And now going back and kind of learning a bit of technique or learning what could, you know, help me further whatever my music and singing and everything. So it's, 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 it's interesting. It's been such a big year for you. I mean, I mean, you've had major life events happen within the last 12 months. And I wonder what excites you the most, what you're excited about your life as this amazing journey you're on continues to evolve. Hmm. I think, yeah, after this year in particular, I just feel like, um, I the, just options in my own head. Like I think any kind of insecurity or border that I thought I had in my own head has kind of come down. And that's kind of exciting because I feel like um, kind of empowered to just kind of take it as far as I could go with it. You know what I mean? Um, and to really be independent in myself as an artist and as, as a singer, as a dancer, as whatever. And um, to not, uh, to not judge it and just kind of go with my instinct and see because it's gotten me to do these great things so far so why wouldn't I continue to trust it you know right so I have one last question for you um okay. <laughs> it's, it's kind of a great question because you're a singer but this season we're focusing on people who have found their voice and okay. I wonder if you feel over the past year that you have found your voice and if you have what do you want to say with this amazing platform that you have and are continuing to build mm -hmm. in in my in my art anything that i make dance singing um i think the most important thing to me is uh just honesty and i think that's something that i would want to i would want to pass on to either next generation or um instill in, in other people is the fact that you can just be honest and yourself in your work and it's completely valid and um you know beauty comes in many forms and i think that's that's an important thing for people to remember because you don't have to compare yourself to anybody or anything and, yeah. beauty comes in many forms so true skylar thank you so much for your time today i know it's later over there in dresden germany um a little bit <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much i so i so appreciate you sitting down with me again and making time and, and sharing your amazing journey over the past year, not just on Idol, but in your life, in your dance, in your music. So I, I, I really appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's fun. Always, <laughs> always. And to those of you who are watching or listening, remember, we all have a voice. So use yours wisely. Bye, everyone. Thank you, Skylar. Bye.